I'm going to, I'm going to do something slightly different. So I'm going to do some educational content just a little bit. Now, mind you what I'm doing, I am taking this from somewhere. This is, this is uh, from my stepfather's book, best lessons of a chess coach. Um, but we are, we are going to go through this and, um, just, just so you guys have an idea of what, like a proper lesson or, you know, proper like intermediate level, um, you know, analysis or a game or how you should think about the game goes. So this game is a game between my stepfather, Sonoware Montre, and Marcus Lamone, I believe. It says M. Lamone in the book from Jacksonville, Florida. I think it was the U.S. Open in 1990. So the game goes D4, D6. White plays E4, and Black plays G6. Or sorry, I got the order wrong. The order is E4, D6, D4, G6. Um, and so this is the modern defense. White plays Knight C3, Bishop G7, Bishop E2. You know, one of the ways that you can set up, not necessarily the, the best way to set up, normally white can be more aggressive, knight f3, bishop c4, etc. but white does the setup. So black plays c6. Um, and the reason that black plays c6 here is to play pawn to b5. So knight, knight to f3 is played here, black plays pawn to b5. And and so um, and so to add from this, what, the point is that black goes for the immediate queenside expansion, which counters white's, white's space advantage in the center of the board. Prior to this move, white's pieces occupied three of the four ranks, whereas black's, black only occupied three of the ranks. One, two, three. One, two, three, and four, for example. Okay, so white plays a3 here, idea to stop b4. And now black plays a6. Um, and the reason that black plays a6 is that black wants to, first of all, strengthen the support of the b5 pawn here from a6 and c6. But secondarily, at some point, you want to look to maybe push the pawn to c5, like bishop b7, c5, open up the diagonal. And by playing a6, you reinforce the pawn so that you can move this one, which was the only pawn protecting b5 before, like this and this. So by doing this, you reinforce b5, and you potentially can play pawn to c5 here. So now white plays white castles here. Um, black goes knight to d7 in this position. <clears throat> white plays h3, and now black plays queen to c7. So the whole point of black's moves, as I said, black prepares for a very simple idea of pushing the pawn to c5 because you've supported b5, you've developed the knight and the queen, and now you're ready to push and try to play on the c file and also open up the long diagonal for the bishop on g7. White goes bishop e3 here. Black does not push c5 because then you'd give white this d5 square for the knight. So black goes knight f6, white plays queen d2, and now black castles here. So, um... And this this is a, a, a critical theme if you're trying to um, if you're trying to learn the game and um, and the point is that white has moved all the pieces off the back rank except for the king and the rook here and the point that's really important and this is a general develop regarding development of um, you know when you're you're starting the game is to, when you're developing the pieces development is not complete until you've connected the rook so once you've castled the king and the rooks are basically on their original rank but they're connected like this. Um, that's when that's when you generally can consider your development finished. Okay, and now the great thing about this book, and this is why I've, I've suggested that people who are intermediate players buy the book or that they look at the book at the very least, is because the book does have situations like this where they say, question, what must Black do com to complete his development following in the theme with what White has done? So I will let chat tell me what the move is here. So what should Black do to complete the development? Let's see. I have, to, I have chat on the screen, so yes. So to take it point by point yes of course the point is you play bishop b7 and now and now by playing bishop to b7 you've completed the develop, development and, and connected the rooks so that that is correct okay so white plays rook fd1 here and now black plays bishop to b7 of course so each player has now completed the development at this point and this is where sort of the middle game begins where you start to have to play for strategies um in the center of the board whether it's like white trying to push the pawn to d5 or e5 whether it's black trying to play e5 or c5 um, and open up diagonals or open up the center of the board. It's very, very complicated. Again, you guys, I'm not claiming this is my material original anyway, but I'm just I'm using this uh, this one game from his book as an example of what you really should be looking for, expecting out of like premier coaching, um, you know, um, in a, in a way that that will help you as a chess player. So, again, the point is there's no contact between the two armies, and every 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 piece is still on the board here. So here's a question from the book, of course, which is which bishops are stronger here? Are the white bishop stronger or are the black bishop stronger? And again, I'll let chat try to answer this question. Uh, the book is on Kindle. Yes, it is. I have it open on my other monitor with um, with the Kindle app. Black bishops are better. Why? Black bishops are better, but why? Diagonals? Okay, but both sides have diagonals. 
Uh, so the reason I'll, I'll, I'll explain it pretty simply here is because the bishops are attacking towards the center of the board here, whereas the white bishops aren't really doing a whole lot. You can tr play bishop here, try to trade the bishops, uh, but your bishop on e2 is not really attacking b5 because black is supporting it twice here. So the fact that the both of the black bishops are aiming right at the cent central pawns here means that black's bishops are better. So now here white plays knight to e1. Mind you, this is not a game that's played perfectly. Don't expect perfect play. Um, so 91, and the point behind 91 is white wants to play f4 and build an even bigger center and try to push the pawn to b to e5 here. So now here, black plays pawn to c5, um, and basically black offers to trade pawns first. Black is willing to open up the center part of the board or exchange pawns on c5. Um, and another, another very simple, it's a little bit simplified, but nonetheless, it's very true, which is when all the pieces are on the board, you want to look to trade pawns in the center, especially to open up diagonals or to open up files for your rooks here, because all the pieces are kind of, both sides don't really have a lot of space to maneuver with. So you're trying to open up the position here. So another question, um, which the book asks as well, which is why does black not play pawn to E5 here? So um, why, why do you guys uh, why do you guys think that e5 is, is not as good as c5? We're, we're going to keep it pretty interactive here because uh, I'm just going through a game. Um, white could play d5. That's not the best move, but there, there's a different reason for it. Um, and the reason that it's not best, and this is why I, I, I very oftentimes, like when people try to just say you should play this opening without explaining the, the true themes behind it, I, I don't like it. Um, the reason is because it's plus 0 0.5. <laughs> Very good response. Um, no, the reason is because what happens is, let's just say white takes. You've closed the diagonal for this dark square bishop. There's a pawn and a knight in the way. So the bishop is never, never going to be able to use this diagonal. And secondarily, you also have not opened up this diagonal either. So you've basically closed both diagonals by playing e5. Whereas when you play pawn to c5, you keep both of the diagonals open. Like white can play d5 here, sure, but you still have an open diagonal towards a1. Um, so, so after c5, the idea, of course, is that you're threatening to capture the pawn on e4 with the bishop on b7 and the knight on f6. Um, so, and, and this is what, what's really important. So in this game, white plays f3, which is not, not, not a great move here. Um, and I'm curious if you guys can figure out what is wrong with white pushing the pawn to f3, besides just the evaluation bar. What, what's wrong with pawn to f3? Uh, yeah, you can play pawn takes pawn, but I'm not asking for moves. I'm asking for like, for like general, general, general principles. Yeah, their weakness is on the dark source, but there's also another reason, which is if we go back here, the whole point behind white playing knight to e1 was to play f4 and expand the center. So now what's happened is white's original idea with knight e1, he's kind of, he's kind of moved the knight backwards, but he doesn't get to build the center anymore. He's now having to play f3, which was not the point of moving the knight out of the way. He wanted to play pawn to f4 and e5. Um, so that's the first thing. The second reason is that the dark squares now become very, very weak on e5, f4, and g3 here. Um, and like one, one note from this book, which is important, is um, uh, it says, uh, some people look at a chessboard and see 64, squ 64 squares, while others look at a chessboard and see 32 dark squares and 32 light squares. If you're strong enough to look at a position like this and say, aha, f3 is bad because it weakens the dark square around the king, then you understand the position clearly. All... Um, where was I? I was saying all, all the kingside pawns are on light squares here on, on h3, g2, f3, and e4. So black will try to attack the weak color complex, being the dark squares around the white king. Now, here's a, here's another question from the book, which is, should black play 13, c4 here? Is this a good move or a bad move? No, it's not scripted, you guys. Um, I'm just taking something from the book to give you guys an example of what a proper, like what a proper educational video for an intermediate player should look like and what the critical questions are that should be asked. Um, so that, that's the reasoning behind this. Um, so it's like, should black play C4 or not? It keeps, white cannot develop the knight to D3 here, right? I mean, knight to D3, is, turn the eval bar off. Okay, I'll turn it off. Sure. I'll turn the bar off for you guys. Um, actually, you're right. Because I'm asking questions. You're, you're right. It's better not to have the bar on. Um, you guys are absolutely right. Since I'm asking questions, it's, it's much better not to. Okay. So, um, so is C4 a good move or bad move? It stops in IT3. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how the, how the book approaches it. Cause it's important to note. It says, you know, C4 is a good move in, in a sense, because it stops white from moving to D3. Um, it, it also, um, uh, it, it also takes away several moves from white here as, as well. Like white can't play like B3 or A4 really here because of B4. So white kind of is restricted a little bit. But the, but the real question is, what is the problem with it as well? 
And the reason that this is not a good move for black is again, it has nothing to do with the valuation, but when you start thinking about um when you when you start thinking about the uh the position, which is that it weakens the dark squares on the queen side here. Um and again, it's very important to note that what happens is you know you start weakening the, the, the opposite color of the of the of the black pawns here on a6 b5 and c4 so long term they're going to be weaknesses like a4 a5 maybe there might be d5 as well and this is where the color complex as a theme is really important um so that that's what that's what i would say is important um and additionally the last point that c4 is not the reason it's not good is you give away control of the center now white has a very solid center here which you can't really attack you can play e5 later but right here you can trade the pawns on d4 so it's really, really important um, to keep that in mind. That's why C4 is not a good move. So the correct move here, that, and this is what my stepfather plays in the game, which is you want to you want to um, open up the center of the board. So you play pawn takes D4, and now white plays bishop takes D4. And um, and there's a question, of course, and this is why I really like the book. Um, you know, I've, I've read it several times, of course, obviously not in recent years, um, but nonetheless, which is question. The opening that started off as a modern has changed character. What does it now resemble? Is it an opening that most players are familiar with? And chat will obviously get this right away. What opening does this now look like? Mm hmm Come on, chat. You guys, you guys are good. It's not the Pyrrhic anymore. What opening does this look like? Don't let me down. This will appear on YouTube down the road. I don't want people writing like, oh, this looks like a Karo Khan. Um, so yeah, it looks like it looks like it's a Sicilian, of course. It looks like a Sicilian, some mix between a dragon with g6, bishop, g7, but also then like the Nidorf setups with d6, a6, and b5. So it's like dragon Nidorf combination, or the Dragdorf, to be more to be really, really technically correct. Um, and of course, that's correct. So it says this happens quite often. You take an opening system, play it in a certain move order, and transpose into an entirely different system. Now, you guys, this is why I will say once again, the number of times that I've made this, that I've talked about playing systems, like only playing the London system, um, as a specific example, or playing Tory or things of this nature, the reason it's not good is because in many cases, to keep improving at the game, you really need to be familiar with pawn structures from different openings versus simply one system that you play. And that's why it's really important because because this came out of a pyrrhic, but now the pawn structure resembles a completely different opening in the Sicilian dragon. So that, that's why it's really important that um, that you play, that you have some familiar, familiarity with multiple systems, multiple openings, and multiple pawn structures instead of simply playing one opening all the time. Um, now, again, if you're not, you know, it's that's all relative, of course, but I, I think it's important to, to, to remember that. Okay, so it says this happens quite often. You take an opening system, play it in a certain move order, and transpose into an entirely different system. The c5 and d4 pawns have been traded, and now we have a Sicilian dragon. Normally, these pawns are traded on the third move. This time, it is happening 10 moves later. Question, if you compare this to a normal Sicilian dragon, Black's pawn structure is the same, but some of its pieces are on different squares. Which ones? So which pieces are different in this position versus Sicilian dragon? Um... So I, I will let, let you guys uh, tell me. Yeah, you, you guys got it. Basically, the, knight, the most things are normal. The knight and the bishop are a little bit different because normally in the dragon, queen is a little bit unusual, but the knight and bishop certainly. Because in the dragon, you, you normally go knight c6 and bishop d7. You don't generally go knight d7 and bishop b7. Um, those are probably the two pieces that are a little bit different. Um, uh, so, so now again, the question is, what is wrong with white's position here? This, this is where like this is something that i can stress like you can look at the valuation bar but you don't really use critical thinking when you approach a game like this which is why most of the time i try to actually like logically work it out during my games and i think it's very important to try and do that during your own games as well so the thing is what is wrong with white's position first of all white's position is cramped white does not have a lot of space here uh i mean you've got like the pawn on e4 and the pawn on f3 but your knight on e1 is not great your rook on a1 it's behind a pawn on a3 you kind of have the half open d-file but it's it's not great either so white's position is just kind of cramped here uh that's the main thing okay and then another question which is where is the white's knight? where should um where should this white knight on e1 optimally be if this was a sicilian dragon you guys um where should the white knight be here so I'll, I'll let you guys try to tell me um f3 would be nice d3 would be nice but in, in the sicilian dragon if you think about the sicilian dragon as an opening the knight should be on one of two squares both are fine it should be either the knight should either be here on d4 or it should be on b3 one of these two squares is where the knight should be in the sicilian dragon so actually the knight on e1 is very very poorly placed considering the way the opening is transposed from a modern into a sicilian dragon here um and additionally the white white bishop on d4 should be on e3 not on d4 here okay 
Um, and so then keeping with this theme of what the book talks about, they say like, you know, um, the bishop should be behind the knight, like the knight should be here, so it's less vulnerable. So if black trades the bishop on d4, is that a good trade or a bad trade for black in this position? Is it a good trade or a bad trade, you guys? If, if let's say I go knight h5 and trade, trade the bishop, is this a good trade or a bad trade? But why is it a bad trade? It, it's a bad trade for white, but why? What's the reason? I know you guys say bad. Give me the reason. Uh, it's not about active pieces. It's the dark squares. White's going to have trouble defending on the dark squares down the road, like e5 and knight f4 um, at some point, maybe even f5 and take on e4. But the dark squares are very, very weak because white has pushed these pawns to h3 and f3 here. So it's important to keep that in mind. So, okay, so black plays knight to b6 here. Um, and now white plays b3. And um, this is not the uh, not the best move. Now, I'm going to read this from the book because this is pretty funny, what, what my stepfather wrote, which is he says, when my opponent made this move, I nearly fell out of my chair. This is such a, this is such a short-sighted move. White is only thinking one move ahead. This does not stop knight to c4 here, um, but the long-term consequences are considerable to this move. Okay, so it says the question, and this is why again why I really like the book and why I would recommend it to intermediate players is that um, what are you? It's kind of like when you think you have to think it through logically versus doing pure calculations. So this move creates weaknesses that will not go away. What are the weaknesses that white has created by playing pawn to b3 here? I mean, what, what has this pawn on b3 done? He might be in chat. I'm, I'm actually not sure, but he, he might be. Anyway, um, yeah, almost fell out of his chair. Yeah. Okay, basically what it does is it, it basically it weakens this knight on c3. Now the pawn on c2 becomes very weak as well because the pawn does not support c3. So it does stop this idea of knight c4, but it creates permanent weaknesses on the c file, which black can go after. Um, so, and basically the answer is, is um, the bishop on g7 is much stronger now, and black can also line up a battery on c8 and c7 towards the knight on c3 and the pawn on c2. That, that's what I would say. So it says, excellent. The C3 square is where the C file intersects with the long diagonal. Again, this is stuff that I don't even really explain that, that well myself. But the point is, the C3 square, it's where the diagonal intersects on this line, the C3 point. So by moving the pawn, white now has weakened, weakened this knight on C3 here. It is there, because, the, because the diagonal intersects on C3, it is therefore a critical square in this position. And because of that, removing the protection by advancing the B pawn weakens both the file and the diagonal. It weakens this file, but it also weakens the diagonal for white here as well. The knight coming into C4 would have been worse, but weakening C3 is much, or it would have been bad, but weakening C3 is much worse. Okay, this kind of mistake is common. Do not sacrifice long-term interest for short-term gain. See, the short-term gain is that you stop knight c4, but you permanently create a weakness on the c file by playing pawn to b3 here. So really important. Um, black is winning, but there's the black should be winning now, but there is still, still some work to do. So my stepfather plays rook c8, white plays rook ac1 here, and now black plays pawn to e5. Very important move, and the reason this is a good move is because now, the, again, as you see, the file, this knight on c3 is very weak. If you put the pawn back on b2, white is doing very, very well here. But by putting the um, by putting the uh, putting the pawn on b3, now c3 is super super weak in this position. So in in this position, um, in this position, white now plays bishop takes b6, which is a mistake. White should probably move the bishop back to f2, and he's only he's only slightly worse, mind you. I mean, it's much easier for black to play after something like queen c3, rook c3, bishop b6, and then something like bishop h6, attack the rook and then play d5 and, and open up the center of the board. You have a double stack coming towards c2, and the bishop on h6 is very nicely placed as well. Additionally, see what happens. This rook on c3 is perfectly placed, and it can't easily be removed from c3 here. So very, very important. Instead here, white plays bishop takes b6, which is a big mistake. Um, so after queen takes b6, white goes king to h1 here. And now, uh, uh, again, reading, reading from the book, it says, now we've come to the final phase of the game. Look, look at white's pieces. They are all huddled together. You have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces all together. Contrast that with the mobility of black's pieces. Rather than interfering with each other's movement, their freedom enhances their, enhances their power. For example, you see the bishop's on a nice diagonal. Bishop can go here. You can move the knight here. The rook is attacking. The pieces don't are not really in the way of each other, whereas white's pieces are all very clumsy, and they're all like right next to each other. So they're not harmoniously able to move around the board. OK. Um, and there's an interesting exercise to help you determine who controls more space. Count the number of squares your pieces are attacking in your opponent's half of the board and compare it to the number of squares he is attacking in your half. 
We can count a square as many times as it is being attacked. A possible capture also counts as a square. Using the position after king h1, let's see who has more control. Um, so doing this, and, and what they say is doing this exercise gives you a sense of mobility. The more squares you can access in your opponent's territory, for example, like you're attacking the pawns, you have all these squares um, potentially, which you can get to here. You'll notice there are a lot, there are, there are actually a lot of squares around white's king that are very, very weak. Whereas when you look at black's position, you have like one weakness here. There's, there's maybe like a square on d5, but there's just no real attacking potential for white. Whereas there are all these different squares, which you can, you can pretty much access, especially the dark squares. Um, and so you, you actually control a lot more space in this position. Um, and that also means the more attacking chances you will enjoy as well. Okay. So here, my stepfather, of course, plays knight to h5. Um, and now white plays king to h and now white plays king to h2. Also, what it, also one other thing that's important that's that's from this book, it says, um, uh, it says black could use more firepower. Which other pieces could he activate besides the knight here? Um, what what's another way you could try to uh, you could try to attack something? Knight h5 is obviously the best, move, but what's another way that you could you could you could do this here? Yeah, you could play rook c7 and rook to c8 and try to double stack and attack towards the c5. That's absolutely correct. That's another way of developing if you don't play knight h5 to attack. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, um, that, that's what I would say is, should be the, um, should be the idea. You play rook c7 or you play knight h5. Um, but the point is you don't really want to play rook c7 or rook c8 because now the rooks are very far away from attacking on the king side. Whereas with knight h5 and f5, you keep the rook here and you can very easily attack. Um, and it says that's the idea. This is crucial. You must understand the importance of getting, uh, um, getting Black's dark square bishop into the game here by playing moves like knight h5 and f5 and then like bishop f6 or h6. Um, uh, even if it appears difficult to do right... <coughs> One second. Um, even if it appears difficult to do right now, you need to try and attack on the king side. Uh, think in terms of what you want to accomplish in a position. First, focus on your overall strategy and then on specific moves. So see, you want to have a strategy like what are you playing for on the king side here? Like, what are you trying to play for before you start looking at individual moves? Very, very important to keep in mind. Um, and very oftentimes, a lot of people don't do that now. The way they think about it, it's just like, oh, you know, I'm just going to play. I'm just going to, like, do this move. or I'm going to do that move or this move. But you don't really have an idea. And when you're only looking at specific moves, that definitely, that definitely is not the right approach. Uh, because you should be trying to figure out what your plan is as well. As well. Now, if you're at a grandmaster level, it's obviously a little bit different, but at an intermediate level, you should not be trying to say, I'm going to play this move and then calculate whole, some whole long sequence. Uh, you should actually try to think about what your plan is overall. Okay, so it says first focus on your overall strategy, then on specific moves. So knight h5 is played here. Now white goes king to h2 to stop knight g3. Now my stepfather plays knight f4. Now another common theme you see here, which is... Um, which is you get the knife on f5, f4, the Gary, the Gary chess concept, where if you get a knight that can't easily be removed from f5 or f4, it's very, very strong. Now, someone in chat asked, queen d6 is not scary. The reason queen d6 is no good is because you can trade the rooks, trade the queens, and then you take the knight on c3, which again is why b3 was a very bad move. It, it basically, um, it created this huge weakness on c3 that would not have existed otherwise. Um, so, so after king h2, knight to f4 here, uh, the, the, the idea is you want to try to attack towards g2. You have like queen f2, you also have bishop h6 as well, and there are a lot of different attacking ideas. Um, so, another thing that's said is, uh, it, which also is very important, is I did not move the knight here to, to, re to capture the bishop on e2. Sometimes you may have friends in the enemy camp. At the moment, the bishop on e2 is my greatest friend. It gets in white's way. Like, for example, you have queen f2, white camp. Like, say the bishop's on f1, and white can go knight e2. White will trade this knight as fast as possible. So the bishop here is, is actually, like, your, your greatest friend because it prevents white from really being able to do anything. Additionally, you can also sack the rook, and there are a lot of weaknesses. Um, it's my greatest friend. It gets in white's way. Right now, you could not pay me to take that bishop. Do not trade active pieces like this knight for inactive pieces like the bishop on e2 here. So, um, so, so, so now, now white plays bishop to f1 here. Again, idea knight e2, also to avoid this rook c3 idea. Like, for example, say you move the rook here. There's also this idea as well, where you get the two pieces for the rook. So white plays bishop f1. So now it takes away queen f2, you don't have rook c3, and white's going to play knight e2 to exchange knights right away on um, on f4. 
So now here, here myself, I plays Bishop H6. Another very, very good move. Um, again, trying to play on the dark squares here. Maybe moving the knight to G2 or H3, even E2 potentially. So there are a lot of different ideas of how you can play this position. So now knight D5 is played here by White. Um, so question: White's last move simply delays the inevitable. How does Black reply? Which way would you capture you guys, Knight or Bishop? Which one? Which way would you capture here? Bishop? Yeah, so black takes with the bishop. Now, mind you, knight takes d5 is also good. You can take take and play knight e3 with the fork. But again, it's not in the spirit of trying to play on the dark squares and attack your opponent's king. So bishop takes d5 is played. White plays pawn takes pawn takes bishop. Uh, now, everything appears in place for the attack. But there's one final preparation to be made, and that is what is the final piece to the puzzle? So everything is pretty well placed. Knight is good. Bishop is good. Queen is good. Like, you'd really like to do something right here with the knight, but you can't really do that. So the correct move is, of course, king to g7, supporting the bishop so that now you can take the pawn on h3 or g2, even go back to h5 potentially and go check in knight g3 and win the game as well. So after king g7, white plays rook to b1. Again, it's already very lost. White can't even really move the queen. These squares are out out because um, they're all covered. If white goes queen b4, again, I think you have knight d5, or not knight d5, sorry, you have knight h5. Maybe you have queen f2. So many different ways that are really good. If white goes g3, you just take the pawn because now your king supports the bishop on h6. Um, so here white plays rook to b1, and now black plays knight takes h3. White goes queen to d3, and now for the final final finish, uh, my stepfather plays queen to g1 check. King takes h3, and now bishop to f4. And this is very simply a checkmate here because the idea is you have queen h2 and pawn to h5. Um, if white plays like king g4, h5, both squares get mated by queen h2. If you try g3, of course, I just take with mate. Um, and if you play just, I don't know, like bishop e2, you go check, king here, and again, checkmate, and your king is stuck on g4. So what is my stepfather's elo? His, his peak fide was about 2350, I think. Uh, he was he was generally somewhere in the low 2200s. Uh, he's much more of a coach than a chess player, but he is a fide master. Um, but that's that's what I would add in terms of this uh, this game. So just thought I would point this out. And this is one thing that I would say, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that when you see see a lot of videos where they where these things are not stressed, where it's like you should play this move or this is the idea, but it's not really explained and there's not a theme. Um, that is, you, you do need to be very careful uh, because otherwise, if you don't understand the themes of what's going on, just looking at pure computer analysis or pure moves will not um, will not necessarily yield you great results once you start playing more over the board chess. Um, he trained you, so he must be one one heck of a coach. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a very, very good coach, obviously. Um, but yeah, the title of the book is called um, Best Lessons of a Chess Coach, and it was written by, by my stepfather, I believe originally. I think it's circa 1993 three maybe it's it's around the time maybe a little bit later um but it's somewhere somewhere in the 90s uh, was 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 when it was originally published it's been published um yeah it was 1993 when it was originally published um it's called best lessons of a chess coach i think there's a command probably in 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 the in chat so you can pull it up um but anyway yeah so i thought i would point that out really really important um and there are many other examples i could go through but i i think i think one is enough for today